Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Alpha Bunga. No, I'm not called that anymore. I, I, it's, I'm still, I'm still doing that every once in a while. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Bunga Cast. It's Wednesday, the 29th of June. My name is Alex Hochuli. I'm here as usual with Philip Cunliffe and George Hoare. Uh, and we are joined once again by a multi-time guest, so regular listeners will be well familiar with him. Uh, it's Alex Gurevich, um, henceforth Alex G. I'll, I'll be Alex H, just for the sake of confusion. Uh, if you don't know Alex, he's the Associate Professor of Political Science at Brown University, uh, the author of a book on labor and Republican liberty, and two upcoming books, uh, one on shared labor socialism and the other on the political ethics of strikes. But what we're going to be talking about today uh, is Roe versus Wade, right to abortion, and the political questions beyond that, perhaps trying to thread a line towards a argument in favor of choice, but also that presents a perhaps alternative or socialist argument for freedom in general, beyond the sort of liberal arguments. So anyway, Phil's going to be leading this one, so I'm going to pass over to him. Thanks, Alex. And welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, welcome back. So it would be useful, I think, for all of us, as well as our listeners, um, uh, especially our non-American listeners, just to have some sense. And I mean, I'm sure everyone, you know, is kind of familiar with the news, but it would be good to have some sense of the background of this um, globally renowned court case, which gave American women the f um, the right at the federal level to abortion. So could you just briefly talk us through what the court case was, the Roe v. Wade court case, what was the background, and before we talk about what, how it, uh, the context of its overturning. So uh, this recent ruling called Dobbs v. Jackson overturned a whole series of cases that go back to Roe v. Wade, which was decided in 1973. And the Roe v. Wade decision held that women in their first trimester had an uh, essentially unconditional right to abortion. And this right was a constitutional right that no state or federal legislature could infringe. And then it said after that, and trimester was supposed to mark the moment of fetal viability. After that, it was permissible to regulate abortion, um, uh, although not wholly deprive women of the right to abortion itself. So Roe really held two things. There, women have, as a matter of personal liberty, a right to abortion. So no state could completely ban or uh, criminalize abortion. And then it introduced a set of tests for determining when that right could be balanced other uh, uh, balanced against other you know urgent or compelling state interests and so the viability test was the one that um that the Roe court came up with and then in subsequent rulings it was felt that viability introduced some problems because with medical changes and differences and so on it looked like the fetus could be viable quite early on. Um, and so the court came up with um, a further concept called undue burden in a case called Casey, which held that even if the in the first trimester, the, the fetus is viable, um, you can't regulate abortion to impose an undue burden on women's, you know, exercise of that right. So that and 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 it should be said that this court decision in Roe took place against the backdrop of the Supreme Court developing a whole new jurisprudence around personal liberty, around the constitutional right to personal liberty or autonomy, which of which Roe is just one part, but included other things like a constitutional right to access to contraception and over time, things like same-sex marriage, uh, free um, constitutional right to um, free choice in personal matters related to sex, marriage, and reproduction. So uh, that 
whole body of jurisprudence then came under attack in this Dobbs ruling in a very direct way. So could you um, could you tell yeah. us yeah can you tell us about the content of the Dobbs ruling then? So the Dobbs ruling I've I've read the the opinions as well as the concurrence. So one thing to understand about the way these things work is that in the US we have judicial review. And my apologies for the pedantry but just to make sure no one is lost from the get go cuz I frankly have studied this for years and still find some of this shit obscure. Um which is one good reason to do away with all of it. Um, but the Supreme Court can engage in judicial review of the actions of the executive, including the president, as well as acts of legislature of the of the Congress, as well as state bodies. And judicial review means that if the Supreme Court finds those acts unconstitutional, then they are declared void and invalid. And so any law that Congress passes, no matter the um, no matter the popularity, no matter the size of majority, if the Supreme Court reviews it and decides that it violates the Constitution, then it is void. Um, now, the, the, the Supreme Court can also review its own decisions, and occasionally it reverses them. So Brown v. Board famously reversed a whole body of previous Supreme Court decisions that upheld the constitutionality of segregation and things like that. And in this case, what Dobbs v. Jackson, the centrally important thing that Dobbs v. Jackson did was declare that there was no constitutional right to abortion because abortion is not one of those areas of personal choice that the Constitution protects as a matter of uh, doctrine. So although they, they say, yes, the Constitution protects personal liberty and says you can't have your personal liberty you can't be deprived of your personal liberty without due process. Um, uh, the court said the plain text, neither the text nor the history of, of um, the long and abiding, I forget the phrase, but the long history of American thinking includes abortion as one of those rights. So that's the headline thing. There is no constitutional right for abortion. And then the second headline thing is to say then it's up to state and federal legislatures to de decide how they want to regulate it. They can do complete bans. They can do partial bans. They can do whatever they like, but it's now up for the democratic decision of states and legislatures to decide what rights people have because the constitution is simply silent. So what changed between 1973 and, and now? Because <clears throat> that's obviously like a complete, a completely different, like opposite interpretation of the constitution, right? On the one hand, right. and, you know, in 1973, there was a constitutional right to this in, you know, 2022, there isn't. I mean, those two things, you know, aren't, aren't these aren't these judgments of these these wise judges supposed to be independent of politics and history? I mean, aren't they just uh, logic? And um, how could they have arrived yeah. at such different conclusions? Well, um, a lot of things happened. So one thing it's important to mention that happened that so far I haven't seen very much discussion of, and. Um, it's one of the most important things to say first is that Roe v. Wade, which was decided in 1973, happened in the middle of a massive democratic feminist campaign to pass, among other things, the Equal Rights Amendment. And so there were really two strategies that feminists were pursuing at the time to enshrine equal rights for women. One was this judicial strategy to try and win it through the court and constitutional interpretation. But the other was to simply use the, it has to be said, extremely undemocratic procedures of the horrible American constitution to nonetheless try to enshrine as constitutional right through the um, complex supermajority procedures of the American amendment procedure. And they got extremely close, one state away. But one of the most important things is that Roe was decided in the middle of the a ratification process. And it made it look like the argument for the abortion right was not this mass majoritarian democratic idea, but something that had to be imposed on society by right. judges interpreting the constitution against existing majorities. And it galvanized, it's arguably one of the most important things to galvanize the right and Phyllis Schlafly and the, um, the conservative women's movement, which whose signature achievement and aim was to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment. 
So it has to be said, one of the first things that happened between Roe and then was Roe itself and the way it undermined this massive act of rare act of popular attempt of popular sovereignty in the United States to enshrine equal rights for women. Um, and um, once it's defeated, it kind of diverted <clears throat> the polit the liberal politics of the right to abortion into judicial activism. And it, and it right. gave the wrong signal really that the only defense and the proper defense of the right to abortion was going to be through the courts. And so liberals and the left kind of retreated from even ordinary legislative efforts in part. I mean, at the state level, it, over time, some states have actually become much more permissive of abortion. But then the other thing happened was that the right didn't just mobilize in sort of a populist way, but you saw the birth of an extremely well-funded and organized conservative legal movement that developed its own body of interpretation and jurisprudence. And slowly as conservatives won more elections and were able to appoint more of their judges to the court, yeah. they were then able, ironically, because they, they were winning elections to appoint judges and influence the, the course and deter and, uh, of mm -hmm. jurisprudence. And then as with everything, there's some contingency. So it was Trump's ability to appoint three judges that allowed them to get the supermajority on the court. Um, and uh, they don't need a supermajority. They only need five justices, but they got six who were committed enough to this body of interpretation to overturn Roe v. Wade. But, you know, if you just think about how, you know, Trump could have easily lost in 2016, didn't take very many more votes, had Hillary been in, been president, probably yeah, would have I mean, ended up appointing a, a, a few more courts, and this could have limped along for a very, very long time. It's yeah. sense, so it's, it's, so it's really, it's, it's all Hillary Clinton's fault for being such a bad candidate. That's that's the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, Alex H. Is, is there a sense in which the status quo ante was a pretty comfortable one actually for both sides? That the left, obviously, as you say, was happy to rely on judicial activism and not have to win any political arguments or political struggles, but that the right was happy to sort of rail against Roe v. Wade, um, but have it there and never really have to take ownership of it and actually be responsible for overturning it. Um, it could just be right. something that would rally the troops. Um, and that maybe right. now this, this has kind of thrown the cat amongst the pigeons. So I'm going to use slightly more concrete terms than the left, just so that we know who we're talking about. But it is, I think it's absolutely true that as with many other issues, the Democratic Party became very comfortable with not having to take responsibility for the abortion issue and to use it as a, you know, as a every two or four years fundraising alarmist tactic, like many others, you know, to ask for money and get people out to vote. But they, <clears throat> even that was always pitched as um, so that we can control court appointments. So they really got out of the habit of ever really having to make the argument the democratic argument to the majority for why there's a right to abortion. And it's clear they're extreme. It's clear from their reaction to the Dobbs ruling that they are extremely uncomfortable with this fact. They really have no idea. There's no coherent plan for how to um, uh, argue their case and for their ability to mobilize people on the authority of their case to engage in the kinds of disruption and political activity that will be needed to start passing legislation uh, at the federal level or even at state levels. Um, they haven't even really done any serious accounting for why they lost so many state houses from the Clinton to the Trump period. There's always swings, but one of the most dramatic political events that's really been under the radar for the past 20 years is the, the sheer number of state houses that the Democrats have just completely lost control of mm -hmm. and which has allowed abortion rights to become very restricted even prior to Dobbs. So it's so important to know that, yeah, sorry. This gets, well, this gets to the to one question I think it's important to do. So, you know, plenty of headlines around the world, including in the UK, about, you know, abortion being illegal in the in the US, effectively, right. which obviously isn't true, like you say. Um, and there are lots of states are moving, you know, already had um, legislation in hand or have moved to quickly kind of make it illegal, taking advantage of the ruling. Um, 
but in aggregate terms, um, yeah. where would you say this leaves the position of U.S. women in terms of access to abortion services should they need them? So I have spent the last two months, ever since the leak um, of the draft, I've been trying to figure this out. And it is it is hard to figure out. So one of the worst things about American federalism is just how obscure it makes the actual legal situation that people face. Uh, face. Yeah. Because you have to dig through 50 different bodies of law and you have to, someone has to compare that to the federal law and then you have to have centralized base. It's really a nightmare. I've been spending the last three or four years just trying to figure out who the police kill. And it's extremely difficult to figure out because they don't centralize information. They don't want you to know. So there's a lot of areas where you just don't even quite know. The best information I find, I found, suggests that there are a number of states where um, abortion was already pretty restricted, but they will make it even more restricted or outright ban it. Yeah. And given that in those states, there were women who were accessing even within those restrictions, abortions, my guess is that there are tens of thousands of abortions that happen a year that won't happen uh, or that will be now illegal in ways they weren't. And so, perhaps I mean, women will find other ways, but it is so. Yeah, talk, we've well, been talking roughly if presumably kind of blue, you know, the most populated kind of West Coast and East Coast blue states will yeah. retain, um, yeah. you know, right. will retain kind of rights to abortion and where right. the majority of people live. Right. So people in the more conservative states in the middle and in the South will right. um, women will lose their right to abortion in those states. That's right. But in population terms, I mean, roughly, what are we talking about? Is it like half, half, two thirds, one third? I mean, what does uh, it so, look yeah, like? I was trying to do the math and it's just so hard because the best national aggregates you get, they use codes like mostly restricted, entirely restricted, but I don't know what those codes mean. Yeah. And you have to go back and do your own work. And I just didn't have the time. I mean, it was really uh, bewildering. So I, it looks to me like about one third of the population will face new, in some cases, quite extreme restrictions on their freedom to get abortion in those states. So it's, it's a real material effect. And yeah. um, um, there's no question about that. It just one thing to add to that is over the past 10, 20 years in the blue states that have um, um, established abortion rights, their, uh, their abortion rights are often um, more open than what Roe required. So in the sense that Roe required at minimum the first trimester yeah. to be unrestricted, what you have in many of these other states is much um, more liberal laws than that. So that's just worth knowing to understand the legal situation. The, the, it, it should also be added that, um, I guess the international reaction, which says, oh, you know, they're banning abortion. The Supreme Court banned abortion. It's just false. What the Supreme Court said is that there's no constitutional right. And so yeah. each state can do it. And the reason that's important is that some people thought they were also going to say something that suggested that fetuses had constitutional rights or had some kind of personhood yeah. as a matter of constitutional law. And that would have then suggested that certain pro-choice legislative laws were themselves unconstitutional yeah. or that the federal government couldn't pass. And they did not. There's nothing anywhere in the ruling that suggests that. That would be the only thing that would have really suggested that the Supreme Court was going to declare abortion to be itself unconstitutional. Yeah. They didn't even hint that. And there's, so, so there was some so there's some chatter as well. And I don't know how realistic this is, which is why I'm you know asking you, you know, that states will go further in terms of um, so say if women who are going to be in red states where they won't have access to abortion mm -hmm. and they seek to travel to secure abortion right. in, in another right. state, that they're yeah. going to be penalized or criminalized in some way. That seems to me, I mean, I, it seems to me very right. difficult to understand how that could be policed, but I could also see a scenario where it's put on the books as a law of, um, you know, kind of a symbolic law of signaling right. their commitment to a particular vision. So I wonder how realistic is that? And right. will, will, those, will we see those also those kinds of laws, that kind of judicial overreach at the level of um, red states that enact the Dobbs ruling? I've been thinking a lot about that because I think it, um, for two reasons, one with how it relates to abortion and another with how it relates to the wider sense in which there's any national politics in the United States at all right now. 
So just, respect to sorry, abortion, just, it, just to jump in, Alex, because yeah. I, I, I was actually going to ask a question precisely on this, like, because you were talking about the different, you know, the different states and a, a third of the population, you know, that's quite striking. So, yeah, I mean, do you think not to, I, I was going to say not to interrupt, but I literally just did interrupt. So, but this, I mean, so I'll throw this question in, you can answer it whenever you like, but <clears throat> yeah, it just makes, it, it makes me think about the, I guess the cultural impact on the, 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 the United States, maybe they're disunited states and yeah. all these kind of think pieces about the increasing breakup of the country. This is like a, this is fuel on the fire because it really is a, you know, such a clear difference between the more liberal and the, and the less liberal or more progressive and less progressive states. So, I mean, do you think, do you think it's that, that, that is the right way to talk about it, that, you know, this is, this is a kind of a turning point in seeing the U S as a nation, or is that too grandiose way to put it? It's funny you say that because I was saying, so well, uh, let me, let's talk about that because it did occur to me that um, uh, one thing that's really different about the period between 1965 and 75, when you get a lot of this new jurisprudence that establishes constitutional rights that protect everybody at the national level as citizens, independent, that and that limits what states can do, is that it happened alongside an immense legislative outburst. I mean, I think that between 1965 and 1975, there were more congressional laws created than in the entirety of U.S. history combined. So it was an immense legal transformation and things, you know, momentous things the 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 Voting Rights Act, right, Civil Rights Act, the um, all of this environmental legislation, um, whatever, like just all of these laws that established um, that, that put their weight behind the idea that at the national, that political problems will be determined and resolved at the national level, the great society legislation. And that this was done because it was some sense that what you're creating was some new national community and putting legislative as well as judicial weight behind the rights and material claims that citizens will have on their government. And the notable thing about the Dobbs decision is that on the one hand, it's a very democratic one in the limited sense that it says, look, it's up for people to decide the constitution. You can, I mean, there's a good argument to say abortion rights are part of what women need to be equal citizens in a democracy. So you could say it's a democratic mm -hmm. right, but people have not, you know, some people say that it's not the most common claim. But what's notable is that I think there is this weird disuniting, as you put it, denationalization of politics. And COVID saw it as well. I don't think anybody, there was no united national experience in the US of COVID because every single decision basically was a state or municipal one or school board one. So, you know, you talk to somebody in Florida, you, you know, I was raging about what schools are doing here. You talk to somebody in Florida and they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, and then other people dealing with like, oh, but we have a vaccine mandate. But what are you talking about masks? Nobody's wearing masks. Or oh, we have access, but no vaccine mandate. Everything. So the, the capacity to resolve problems at the national level and the, the fact that they'll be done is not what's behind the court. And the court is sort of saying we're going to solve these problems by denationalizing each state. I mean, they didn't right. say the federal government can't do it, but it was clear in all of the discussions as well as the wider public reaction that the sense in which the peak of our politics and our central problems are going to be resolved is oddly enough, not at the national level. Um, so it's not just a kind of loss of a constitutional right that everyone would have as a citizen. It's that also the politics have kind of got pushed and displaced um, and the capacity to represent and resolve these problems is really sclerotic. So, that is one thing. That's I, that was the sort of more general thought I yeah. had about this crossing boundaries. I'll just say to the to your specific question, Phil, that um, it looks very unlikely that those that there is a majority on the court willing to hold those kinds of bans constitutional. Brett Kavanaugh made very clear he thought that it was unconstitutional in his concurrence. And so, it, what is I, what is unconstitutional? It is unconstitutional unconstitutional for say the state of Georgia to say that one that a resident of Georgia who um, crossed state lines to get an abortion committed a crime that Georgia can punish because it violates federalism. Ironically, 
And there's yeah. so much precedent, it seems hard to believe. So I don't even know if they could symbolically get it on the court because it would get right. challenged and I don't see the Supreme Court upholding that. Yeah. Um, um, uh, One thing that, that would seem yeah. interesting about this moment, I mean, Biden's response, as well as the usual pablum of, you know, I really feel that this is a difficult time for women and I understand your pain or all that kind of stuff. Yes, uh, yeah. There was another, I guess, typically democratic sort of moment, uh, capital D democratic moment, where he said, you know, we're going to try to help people get across state lines. Um, and that seemed to be at least I read that as another yeah. sort of abnegation of responsibility. And it's the Democrats, again, pretending like they're the little guy up against, you know, kind of the big forces of conservatism and that they're like some small revolutionary cell or guerrilla organization, which needs to ferry people over, over state lines to get um, abortions, um, ignoring but the I, fact that they guess, have effectively a super majority, you know. Um, and I guess it also consciously evokes the kind of the um, rebel escape. Uh, so the, the slave escapes as well. Yeah, and the right. Underground Railroad yeah. and all that nonsense, right? I mean, that's presumably the intent of messaging like that. Yeah, and I mean, so I, I just want to take the opportunity actually just to double back to a question that I asked earlier because it didn't uh, come to the second part of it, Alex, which is that uh, obviously the Democrats have been complacent and very comfortable with the sort of status quo ante, but that conservatives may have been uh, comfortable with the status quo ante as well because they could rail against Roe without having to take responsibility for actually overturning it and the political consequences that that might actually have. I don't know. I don't know about whether it's symmetrical. So I, I think it's true that the Republicans also, um, you know, were quite comfortable with raising money and winning votes on the base backs of appointing judges and justices and so on. But the thing is, what they offer their voters is the rewards of ruling through the most undemocratic institutions in the United States. I mean, the Republicans are a minority party mm. and their political project is sort of increasingly explicit about ruling through the courts, the Supreme Court, the Senate, and the Electoral College, that all of the counter-majoritarian institutions of our constitution are the ones that they're kind of um, committed to and want to organize their followers to. So this in some ways... I, I, I think that probably what happened is they were apprehensive and then the total lassitude of the democratic response and the shock, I'll admit I have, I'm a little shocked of the fact that they, the best they could think of was to go sing on the steps of Congress, that there was no plan. They really didn't have a huge coordinated response to this, despite the leak and having two months to sort this out. I think my guess is in some ways kind of emboldens the Republicans because they think, well, the back, you know, the backlash is not that bad. Um, uh, and so at some point, the Republicans might pay the price. But um, I think that it's a bigger problem for the Democrats who have played the lesser evil game for so long which was a game of kind of blackmailing and bullying people into voting for them rather than making a good strong case and trying to mobilize people belong behind whatever that case was, that it's kind of a bigger problem for them that not only this ruling happened, but that the court is entirely out of reach. Nobody can vote for a Democrat thinking, Oh, well, if I, if we get the Democrats in power, they'll, they'll appoint the judges that we care about. Cause it's, it's, it's done. It's over. It's six to three Republican court. It is out of reach and it kind of forces the Democrats to take some responsibility for what they themselves are going to do. So I'm not so, sure that there's a symmetrical problem of both for Republicans and Democrats having to take responsibility for what to do from here. So I want to I want to come to the question of the um, what are the political options on the table for both sides um, and further right. kind of try and map out the kind of political paths out of the out of this particular juncture. But just briefly, I wanted to I mean, this is not just for Alex, I suppose, but for everyone about the how to read the politics of the leak. 
Um, so not, I should stress, you know, when this was leaked in advance, so we knew it was coming, like you say, and even more strikingly, the Democrats don't seem to have prepared for it over the last couple of months. Um, not so much in speculating on the motives of who, you know, of what the leaker was thinking. And I don't know if there's any kind of, um, if any fingers have been pointed at any uh, department within the Supreme Court in particular, but more about how the politics of the leak played out, because... At least to my mind, it seemed to me kind of very much in keeping with the kind of democratic strategy of tension, you know, yeah. modeled on the uh, the 1970s kind of Italian Christian Democrat, where there's constant cranking up of insecurity in order to um, and playing on voters fears in order to force uh, or, you know, blackmail and bully voters essentially into, in this case, supporting Christian Democrats um, and a strong state against uh, the menace of the Red Brigades and behind, you know, and underneath that and beyond that, an organized working class. And obviously the situation is different. And I'm suggesting here that it's kind of flipped. We have the Democrats um, kind of mounting a strategy of tension, I think, partly with, as we saw with the Black Lives Matter protests. But it seemed also to me that the leak played into their hands very well. You know, kind of this was the um, the kind of, you know, the thing that they'd always terrorize their voters with. Uh, was going to happen and they got advance notice of it Um, and it arrives at the perfect kind of time in terms of uh, you know a very weak presidency um, very unpopular president all sorts of problems coming down the road in the midterms and with the possible Trump candidacy again and find there's something now which can galvanize what was otherwise looking like a decidedly kind of shaky um, a shaky political project. So it seemed to be it in keeping with that. It didn't work, at least immediately, in the sense of it's like a horror film where you, you've got this um, <clears throat> this thing you've been you've been terrorizing people with, and then you you finally show it or it's finally revealed, and it doesn't have the impact that that it that it could have had in people's minds, or at least that's the way I would read it. That the you know as you said, Alex, the Alex G, sorry, the backlash wasn't wasn't as 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 bad as you know you might have expected. The organized response on the part of the democrats wasn't they didn't make as much hay as you 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 kind of would expect them to if that was their strategy so i think it's you know <clears throat> in terms of what the the different because i mean i guess you you know you, you can't know the, the the motives of the person who leaked it but certainly you would you would sort of beforehand have expected the democrats to have used this as a massive mobilization tool and to gain some you know some political kind of energy momentum from it and that's you know, yeah, if so there is no. So I, t- I mean, I take your point, George. There is no Andriotti kind of equivalent figure um, on the on the democratic on the dem- in the democratic kind of ranks who would be the kind of master manipulator of a strategy of tension as there was in 1970s Italy. Um, but nonetheless, the kind of the you know the um, the kind of the shock, uh, the horror, the um, again the kind of incipient fascism brewing in the U.S the long away, you know, the kind of the horrible climax, like you say, of what, you know, people have been threatening for so long, all of that seems to me to play into um, Mm. the Democrats kind of uh, Mm. base, even if they haven't, even if they're so disorganized, they can't kind of... They haven't, they haven't got a strategy to make any... I'm kind of... I'm kind of with that as well. I mean, people were joking that the only thing the Democrats prepared in the interim was a a fundraising email, which then they immediately sent out en masse. Um, But I, I, I'm... And I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you, Phil, that it probably strengthens the Democrats' blackmail. Now, if you don't vote for a Democrat, you're basically don't care about abortion rights, don't care about women. And so see, on. I don't I, I mean, I know what you're saying. I think the difference is that in one sense, it is clearly weakens the blackmail because now the Democrats have to say what they're going to do with the vote. Yeah. Before it was, we'll appoint justices that will protect Roe. Well, that's yeah. it. That's over. Right. This is what everybody's pointing out is all they have left is the kind of fever pitch kind of crisis atmosphere. But what are we supposed to, you know, what, what are you supposed to do with that? So why would you vote if you're not being told what they're going to do with the vote? A number of people have pointed this out, actually. In fact, Harris, Kamala Harris was asked this where she said the most important things to vote. And, they, and someone asked her, well, but what will you do? <laughs> if, if if elected, you know, because the yeah. court's out of reach. And she said, well, we're not committing to anything right now or something like that. You know, someone listed the things that AOC had said. And she said, well, we're not committing to anything right now. And it's like, whatever you think of what AOC said, it's even worse to just say, you know, it really, I mean, it is 
turning vote into something sort of like, you know, profit accumulation, vote for the sake of winning so that you can vote again for the sake of winning. It's like, well, well, for what? What's the end? What's the point of doing it now that the one thing that you might get out of it has been taken decisively away, which is not just the constitutional right to abortion, but any ability to control the Supreme Court. So I, I think the way I saw the leak, I don't know. I think it's more, it was more plausible to me that it was a liberal clerk than a conservative clerk who leaked it. Um, I think the counter argument is, it's pretty clear from Roberts's concurrence that he didn't think that the, that the entire precedent from Roe should be overruled. He thought that this was uh, that, that you didn't need to say there's no right to abortion in the constitution to rule in this case. Um, uh, and that there was some alternative, you know, workable rule that would protect a woman's limited right to choose. So yeah, perhaps it was coming from a Roberts thing. I, I think that's unlikely, but it's perhaps, I think it's more likely it's a liberal, but what I think it taps into is less the Bismarckian, some Bismarckian figure who gets that this strategy of tension is the way to rule, then it is just the native way of doing politics that has ruled yeah. the leading elements of the Democratic Party yeah. for ages now. I mean, yeah. think of how they responded to Trump. It was just like one permanent emergency. And then yeah. they, and they couldn't win. They kept saying, oh, he's going to we're going to get into nuclear war with North Korea. And then that was obvious. That was, oh, we're about to invade Iran. It's not, not going to happen. And then on the next terrorist attack, he's going to clamp down on society. And that didn't happen. You know, and then COVID was finally their chance to declare a complete state of emergency, all yeah. which is really just to defeat Trump. And then once that wore off, they found Ukraine, yeah. right? And and it's and they they don't know they, they mobilize because they don't know how to organize and represent, and so their only way to mobilize is to keep people in just a constant state of hysteria. And so yeah. now the January six hearings are the next thing, and like this incredible thing, which really turns out, you know, this new secret, the 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 surprise witness. It turns out that you know Trump got tricked into getting his own car, and the reason he was pissed that people with arms weren't being let in is because he thought the photo op looked bad. You know, yeah. we totally trivial stuff that we're supposed to say is just the knockdown evidence that the, the the demon wasn't, you know, we've unmasked the demon. It was the coup, yeah. So I think it's that, that the Democrats, whoever the, the liberal clerk that leaked it, if it was liberal clerk, it, it's it's a strategy. It's it's a it's a unconscious strategy of attention, attention yeah. if it is one, because it's strategy anti strategic. It's anti strategic. Right. What, it, what so is prohibited is, yeah. is stepping back. You know? So I I agree. I mean, I think, and I would I withdraw, Your Honor. I withdraw the remark. So um, <laughs> well, it's a bad yeah. saying. Strategy is obviously right. it right. imputes kind of too much kind of uh, forethought into it. Um, right. So I want to, before so we need to get into the um, the politics, you know, the kind of the politics of this, of uh, kind of uh, getting around it, I guess, what that might look like, or the, indeed the politics of reinforcing it as well. Um, what that might look like um, for those who wish to kind of um, strengthen this precedent. But first of all, uh, so there's been a lot of criticism over the kind of the principled idea of the, so my understanding is that the Roe decision was rooting the idea of a constitutional right to abortion in the idea of a right to privacy, and that this right. has been seen as a weakness. So it wasn't an actual kind of constitutional right, in, you know, which stood alone and apart for women, but was something which was um, kind of uh, bundled together with a broader and, uh, you know, something broader and more schematic. And this is partly why it's not been as deeply institutionalized in U.S. kind of politics as it might otherwise have been. So. Is it problematic to root a constitutional right to abortion and a right to privacy? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I just don't think it gets at what the best arguments for the right to abortion are. Uh, and uh, I think that that was one of the oddities about it was, I mean, it was at the time, many liberal judges and justices and law scholars, as well as political figures like, and later Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself said they thought that the legal basis for saying that such a right exists and extends to abortion exists. But I think the problem was deeper. It's also politically not the best argument. Yeah. Uh, and I think the best argument is that uh, uh, women should be free to decide when and whether they're going to have babies um, and that nobody should be forced to have a child. Um, and that's because we have a universal interest 
in abortion, that it's not just that that harms the particular woman who's forced to have a child, but that everyone has an interest in their decisions being truly free, yeah. that the decision to have a child is and should be a free one. But when it's surrounded by force and coercion, when you know that it's something that you're forced to do, if you don't happen to want to do it, then that that isn't just a violation or harm to the bodily autonomy of the woman who's forced to have a child. It also undermines the meaning of that choice and the value of that choice to, to everyone else. So I think that that's the, to my mind, that's the best kind of argument. There's, we have a universal interest in living in a society in which people choose freely, whether they're going to have children or not. And, um, uh, um, and, and I think that next to that is the very strong argument that for women to be able to participate with equal freedom in this society, they can't be forced to have children. Yeah. So um, I think that's a very good argument um, as well. And it's close to the right to privacy. I mean, the right to privacy wasn't really in the end, the only argument that was made. There was also this kind of argument that was sort of like a bodily autonomy argument that was like this one. And, 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 and it's one that the, that the uh, majority opinion had to deal with um, in the horrible language of the court. But that one's, I think, a better argument and was part of the jurisprudence of Roe and later decisions. And it was about the, the argument for bodily autonomy because women needed to have it to participate as equals in society. If they can't choose when and whether to have children, then um, that is far too uh, disruptive um, uh, to their lives and prevents them from taking advantage of all of the freedoms that men do in the same way. Uh, yeah. that men have in the same way. So the court, as we said, in one of the less plausible parts of the majority opinion, they claimed that this was not, um, women weren't being treated differently by the, um, by an, if their freedom to have an abortion was prohibited, which is just implausible. So um, I guess I'm curious to, um, you know, I'm curious to get it from uh, an American about the, about the kind of politics of the other side, I guess, and particularly with libertarianism. So something that's very mm. striking, you know, um, if you, I mean, compared to libertarians here, at least, there's a very kind of public and vocal um, overlap between libertarianism and strong um, Christian evangelical politics yeah. in the US. Right. And I was wondering, you know, how do they square, you know, such kind of um, strong arguments for individual autonomy and personal liberty um, with, I mean, how do they deal with arguments that this is, okay, you know, this is a question of liberty as well for right. women specifically. Right. I'm just curious about how they get around that and if they do in, have any kind of way to get around it or if they just kind of flub it. Um, I, I, I've asked some libertarian friends and acquaintances of mine um, this question. Are they Christian uh, tried... as well, these friends, acquaintances? Some are, some aren't. Um, and uh, sorry, can, can you can you describe <clears throat> for our non-American listeners the the libertarian, not necessarily the individual acquaintances, but something about their because I'm I'm imagining bow so, bow ties and um, <laughs> that they're kind of class. Like what, what color bow ties are these uh, libertarian acquaintances? The classic Republican American uh, American yeah. academic. So I, th I mean, my view is this, there, there's, there are two anti-state ideologies in the U.S. that are quite that, that longstanding, libertarianism and anarchism. And the difference is that libertarianism has its social foundation in groups that had dominated, who found their domination weakened or undermined by state intervention, which is why I think historic libertarianism is predominantly white, male, and wealthy. And then anarchism is also an anti-state ideology. And people sometimes wonder, well, why aren't, why don't those two people agree more often? And, uh, but the thing is the anarchists tended to come from the working class um, and for whom the state was an instrument of repression of their collective struggles. So the historical and political foundations of them are, are quite different. Um, but it also, I think, explains some of the contradictions of American libertarianism then, because some are quite Christian because they, they object to many of the state's interventions that limited 
the hold of the church over things like education and and so on and uh and uh, that also the state expansion of the 20th century happened with the influence of secular intellectuals and the left um, even though they were often always minority. And so, you know, with the New Deal and things like that. So um, some libertarianism is really about personal liberty and bodily autonomy. And so they're pro-abortion. Many libertarians are pro-abortion. They, they certainly think that um, it should be part of the liberty that the Constitution protects. While others, they resolve it by just saying the fetus is a person. And all, no person, you know, if the fundamental liberty is not to be killed by someone else, then it's murder. And um, and they carry, you know, and that just connects up to a wider libertarian view. So, um, and also some libertarians are men. <laughs> Many for them, it's just is men yeah. who um, don't think that the women should have the unilateral right to decide what happens to their child. Yeah. Um, and they think that therefore women should be prevented from getting rid of their child. And so when I say these things, I'm talking about political views I see expressed. I'm not talking about sort of philosophical libertarians who've written this or that about abortion. This, yeah, that's more a sure. general camera. So, so, but it's, it's, it, there's no single coherent libertarian position um, because of that internal division, I think, yeah. within it. So I guess that takes us to thinking about political futures um, yeah. out of this, which is what are the options available mm. to those who believe in liberty and in women's right to choose? Right. Um, right. And one thing that struck me kind of observing from afar is that it seems to me there's much more, I mean, this might be just wishful thinking on my part, but there does seem to me to be at least more widespread recognition of the um, problem that the American left has over relied on judicial activism and right. the veneration of the right. Supreme Court at the expense of actual kind of democratic majoritarianism. And I yeah. have to say, I mean, I've been quite surprised to see this kind of emerging in unexpected places, this kind of very basic democratic point. Um, and it made me somewhat, I mean, I was surprised and maybe hopeful that perhaps in some, in some areas, people understand the idea that liberty has to be rooted in kind of, um, you know, popular acclaim rather than judicial activism. So where where are we at with that? What are the paths out? Yeah, I mean, if there is any silver, you know, there is a silver lining to the ruling, which is not just that it forces everyone to confront that it really, that the existing state of law barely protected the right for many women and that much more needed to be done, but that it really forces, as you say, it, it, it forces um, people who care about the right to abortion and liberty generally to win it democratically. But the problem is that uh, nobody knows what to do. Nobody knows how to do it. Nobody has any sense how to do it because there's a difference between forcing that fact onto a, the political scene and there being a force or body able to make something of that fact. I think you all, or at least those of you who live in the UK, are seeing that with Brexit, right? I mean, Brexit was a necessary democratic act to restore sovereignty to the United Kingdom. But there was, since then, there's just no um, party or political force that really able to carry out and realize the democratic possibilities of that act. Abortion is sort of more, uh, not quite the same, yeah. not, not equivalent, it's slightly, but it's a slightly similar different. thing. It's slightly different, though, in this, in respect of this. I mean, so, you know, there is a parallel, I grant you, but it's slightly different in respect of the fact that Brexit had, um, yeah, there was kind of a clear, the constitutionality um, aligned right. with the kind of democratic decision. Whereas right. here, you know, the constitutionality, yeah. as least right. as interpreted as the Supreme Court, is right. out of kilter with what That's the polls right. say is the majority of, um, of what right. American citizens think. Um, and the problems with Brexit, you know, are to do with kind of, uh, are to do with the lack of uh, connection, I suppose, between the governed and the governing, and how that um, undermines the capacity of the govern of the governing, in fact. So yeah. we have a profoundly weak kind of uh, set of political representatives 
um, and the lack of, you know, cadre simply in the level of the state to take advantage of the democratic opportunities that are offered by um, the electoral kind of revolt that Brexit was. Whereas in the U.S. case, it seems to me it's the kind of the fact, I guess, that the Democrats have kind of burned down anything or kind of an X and occupied anything which looks like a popular movement. And so presumably yeah. that's part of the reason there's no kind of basis on which to to organize um, against this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess, so I was thinking about, so the, the, I would say the, the two things that are tellingly different about Brexit form abortion are first, Brexit was itself a popular democratic decision. Whereas here, the overturning of Dobbs is in some ways just as illegitimate as the original rulings, because it was it was clearly a political decision by nine people. So there's nothing more legitimate than about, you know, this, they can say there's no right and the original law was bad, but it's still a political decision and everyone can see that. But the second thing is you the United Kingdom has a very democratic constitution. Once you leave Brexit, now it is so clearly in the hands of the parties to work this out in Parliament. And so the gap between the Tories and the electorate is, or, you know, with or any of the major parties in the electorate is very vivid. Whereas in the United States, we have the further problem that our constitution is extremely undemocratic, which means that even if there is, it's not just that the Dobbs decision is just as sort of illegitimate as the previous ones, but because it's a decision by a random six people who are there for random political reasons, but also that there is, and who are somehow going against majority will, but that the majority doesn't have a clear institutional means of expressing its will, right? So if we want to take the ordinary democratic legislation path, it's extremely difficult to do so at the federal level because the Senate has to agree. You can have 70% of the population want to do this and still not get their well represented in Congress because, um, you know, uh, uh, not only is there even even if you abolish the filibuster. And for those who don't know, the filibuster allows the Senate to prevent a bill from being passed in the Senate unless there's 60 votes in the Senate. And since there's only 100, there's a, 100 senators, two from each state. So that means that you need the votes of 60 senators which if you go to the least populous states, that means, you know, something like 20% of the population can stop or prevent ordinary legislation. Yeah. So yeah. then what about the Supreme Democratic Act of amending the Constitution? We have the, the, the only thing that's harder to amend than the United States Constitution is the Lisbon Treaty, the European Union. That's the only thing that's harder to amend than the United States. And the United States is phenomenal. I did the calculation. And because you need three quarters of the states to approve the, um, the final amendment, you, you first you need two thirds of the Senate to pass, to agree that there is going to be amendment, which will then be sent to the states. And then you need three quarters of the sense of the states to approve it. Yeah. Um, uh, something like 11% of the population can prevent the amendment from being passed. There's no so way to do this. I think, I think you're mistaken, actually, because remain and reform this this idea is yeah. actually very easy <laughs> to uh, to make changes to the structure of the European Union. Um, I think I think you're just laboring under. It's a position. There. It's a position taken by people only if they have no idea what they're talking about. You know, like it was just absurd, right? So, it's just absurd. No, indeed. <clears throat> this was why the, the Equal Rights Amendment, ironically, there's a debate right now. I mean, it's obscure and no one cares about it, but some people claim it was passed because later states kind of kept ratifying it. And if you add it up, it looks like three quarters did, except some reversed. And so it, it, we have so hard to amend that the normal democratic paths, this, and so this part of the problem is that here, because of the undemocratic nature of our constitution, the parties can say, and they're not lying, they say, well, what do you want us to do? Mm. And they, so they can avoid responsibility for trying to answer the question and say, well, the institutions prevent it. So I wanted we, to ask, you know, I mean, yeah. sorry, I mean, but it faced with um, obviously the reliance on anti-democratic or counter-majoritarian institutions, both on the side of the Republicans, as well as the Democrats through their reliance on judicial activism to kind of um, see through their politics or to defend their kind of policy preferences, for example, on abortion. Um, it, it's obviously op opened to sort of avoid for there to be made a popular 
or in democratic argument, but maybe those should be in quotation marks. Because I mean, one example I have in my head was I heard Tucker Carlson making this argument, and I don't know how representative he is, though no doubt he speaks, I suppose, for some um, section of the population or has a certain appeal there. Um, Farcically kind of making this argument from Ipanema Beach in Rio, but anyway, that's a <laughs> that's just an aside. Um, but it basically making the argument that um, one, that this was the overturning of Roe versus Wade is actually democratic because it allows people to decide in the states um, instead of uh, having it be um, a, a purely judicial ruling, which, you know, is half of an argument. But I think, as you've already pointed out, there's there's problems with that, too. Um, but that also uh, this argument, which grasps at a materialist argument around abortion, which I don't find entirely convincing. I mean, it's namely that feminists are in league with uh, the elite and with corporate America because corporations effectively don't want uh, women workers to not turn up to work by getting pregnant and having to pay um, leave and uh, and all the rest of that, right? So that's like you're you're you know doing that throwing hand motion where you're dismissing an argument, right? I don't buy that either. Um, but the radical left responds with its own sort of materialist argument, which is actually no abortion bans, and I've seen this quite widely on on the radical left anyway. That uh, and, and not just in the U.S. that abortion bans served capital's need for the reproduction of the labor force. That basically yeah. the reason this is happening is because uh, the judges are doing the work of capital in making. Uh, women have more babies because they need, you know, to, to kind of churn more people through the workforce and reprodu reproduce the working class. Now, I don't buy either of those, but it's interesting that there's a sort of grasping towards finding some materialist case for why this has happened. But yeah. to me, they're mutually exclusive. They run against each other. And I don't find either that of them particularly convincing on their own grounds. But anyway, I wanted your, your take on it. So I'll, I think that um, so I think we can dismiss the argument that says that we're getting abortion bans because um, capitalism needs more workers. Uh, because if it were that mechanical, you couldn't explain why the only place where it's being restricted is in the one place that's able to rep re replace workers with immigrants, which mm -hmm. is the U.S. Yeah. The replacement rate is. Is lower in Europe, and they're not. You've seen an expansion of abortion rights. So I just it it. I think it's a very poor mechanical argument. I mean, there, there the is argument, argument that the GOP bosses, specifically. Sorry, just that the GOP second, specific, right. There is the argument that GOP specifically, because they want to restrict immigration, they need this. Uh, they need surplus labor, so they need you know native born babies. I, but. Look, I actually think there's a certain kind of vision somewhere in conservatives that 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 holds that together and might actually believe that but i don't think they're thinking about it in marxian terms they're they're thinking more racially uh, but and demographically sort of the way like you know israel thinks about jews relative to palestinians or something like that not about the size of the reserve army or it's even its composition but but the the thing i have more sympathy for is actually the materialist argument that a different version of the materialist argument that worries about bosses making women have abortions. Because I think there's actually, I was talking with um, Cam Hardy, who I don't know, have you ever had Cam on? Yeah, the, we haven't had him on the you, podcast, but we're- I'm, You should. Um, he And he was pointing me, that he was reminding me of stuff and I didn't really know a lot of this stuff about just how long the, uh, the argument among the left and communists, and this is also something I liked about the Ethan Linehan, Linehan, I think that's his name, article on sublation. It's is in that show notes. Yeah, there's a long-standing argument about how to think about why abortion should be decriminalized. It should be permitted, but there's still a reason to think that it's regrettable, which is that in a society like ours, where many women are choosing to have abortions because they can't imagine raising one given how bad their circumstances are, or because it means just bringing in, you know, means working class women bringing into being another generation to be exploited by capitalists, or just into a society that seems to have no real future for them, or just makes having children such a burden when they don't want it to be. That there's a reason to think that there are many women having abortion who wouldn't be if society were organized to respect and honor their freedom to make, to, to give them real choices in life, um, you know, proper maternity leave, universal health care, and so on, or universal child care, you know, good public education, decent, you know, jobs for everyone, equal sharing of the burdens of social life. And um, that's a really longstanding argument that I think is sort of dimly reflected in the bosses make women have abortions. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that happens in some places, actually. But it is a way in which the left, I think, once was able to talk about and doesn't 
I suppose what I liked about that article by Ethan it hasn't really recaptured or dimly captured, which is the sense in which it is right to think that in some ways many abortions here and now are regrettable um, and reflect just how poorly we um, um, and just how unfree women are. That, that ironically, that in some cases, the having of the abortion is an index of their under freedom mm. or it reveals their freedom because they are not free. Uh, many of those women are not free to live decent lives and have children. And so they, they're stuck in a choice they shouldn't face. So, um, uh, so this, uh, this is, and, an... and so it shouldn't be the case. So like, I, mean, I even see there's like quite extreme. I, I saw a few women, there was a, a woman who's, I don't remember her name, but who makes a lot of headlines in the U S for saying how she was a rape victim and chose to have the child. And and hates the people who want to defend abortion rights on the basis that, well, what about the, the rape victim? And the, the truth about what I thought that was interesting about what I thought she was saying was like, yeah, sh- there can still be a dignity in deciding to have the child. The problem is that she represents that as if it's just a purely personal choice. And of course, in some cases, you know, choosing to do something against immense adversity is just itself an act of human dignity. But another thing is just the indignity of being in the position of feeling mm. like you can't raise a child. And that's a social failure. Mm. Yeah. And so the sense in which there's a profound social failure that gets re- reflected in who it is that has abortions and how many is, I think, a, is is raised, a real problem. And is raised by the left, is sent by the left response. I mean, that's the thrust of what you're saying, right? You know, I would just say there's been like a kind of very disparate and disparate kind of not super coherent response. So you can, there are many people on the left who pointed out, oh, well, the right isn't really pro-life because the minute the baby's born, they don't give a shit, Yeah, you know? And so that's a version of the argument I think I was just giving, which is the indignity of, of having it, but it, but, but when the left says that, I don't, you know, I don't think that's quite, that's more a debating point. It isn't yeah. reworked as a point about dignity and freedom. And I think that the best point is to say it's a problem of, of, of human dignity and freedom. It's just undignified to put people in a situation where their choices are have an extremely difficult life having a child because there's so little social support, or you take a huge blow to your career or to your profession or just like your income, or have an abortion, you know? And so it's certainly, and in some sense, it's it's pretty horrible, but, you know, because suddenly some people are in a position where that that's now a choice that they have that they have to take yeah. responsibility for, and it's a it's a pretty horrible choice to situation to be in. So, so I want to talk more about the response of the left, um, but just to, yeah. I suppose, just to see if there's a way to. I mean, from what you're saying, there doesn't seem to be any. There's that no one is offering a way out essentially yeah. right yeah. at least there's no way out on the table at the moment um and there's even the possibility of a kind of denationalization effectively if this becomes totally. kind of the status quo that it entrenches a kind of uh, non-national politics so how did the democrats rally i guess in yeah. this context and can they you're saying that you know there's no options on the supreme court but can they pack the court uh, i genuinely don't know i mean i uh, it, uh, it it was only like Saturday when I thought, oh, they're going to do the same thing with this. I somehow thought that this it's such a it's such a moment that seems really like a not a turning point, but a dramatic change that is different from other changes that I thought the Democratic response would be different. Yeah. It, you know, uh, it, it, I'm not uh, like hopeful or naive, but you still you can't also just become a kind of incurable cynic and just assume that everything's been the same. So I, you can't totally lose the surprise when you realize. So it was sort of surprising me to realize, oh, maybe they're just going to do the same thing they always do. You stir the pot, you 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 kind of beat the drums for a while and wait for the next thing, yeah. you know. And um, so it's possible that they're just going to run on vote for us because the Republicans are the ones that overturned Roe. Yeah. I, 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 and it's possible they'll just do that, in which case, you know, they're more of a suicide cult than I thought they were, uh, you know, but I still don't quite see how they can do that. They have to say something about yeah. what they're offering. How is it that they are themselves going to do something since they cannot appoint justices? So they can't pack when, the court. Sorry, they, they, there, there are no openings. So 
either they have, but, they, but it, it's really different it, to say we're going to cr- uh, pack the court is a dramatic constitutional change. It's permitted. It's not, it's, it's a constitutional, not in the, it's happened before. It's a normal P it doesn't require you to change the constitution. Nonetheless, everyone gets that it's a very significant act and that it has only once really been done in order to change the political balance of the court. And that was always threatened in the, the 30s. Yeah. Do you think they're going to sort of intimate that they may <clears throat> they may sort of create some openings on the Supreme Court? Like, I mean, is, is this is this a sort of a, a, strat- a strategy of like very, very implied like judicial murder and then replacement with is this a joke, George? Judges. Is this a joke, George? Or no, I'm just wondering. Joke, like, it, it seems like honestly. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a facetious comment, but it seems like really? that's 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 the. It honestly seems like that's that's the only thing that they can really say is like we we don't we're out of options. Like, maybe you know there'll be some. Oh, wait, they could. But wait, so there is a precedent, months. right? The favorite yeah. Democratic president, FDR, threatened to pack the court in the 30s right. over the New Deal. Yeah. Um, they wouldn't do it. Though. Didn't do it in the end. But I mean, presumably that will be their go-to, right? FDR did it. I, I don't like think FDR. so. I, I think a friend of me, uh, uh, someone once told me that there, there was this uh, New Yorker cartoon a long time ago, which shows two senators standing outside Congress saying, my instinct is to do, to do the cowardly thing. I just don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it, it, you, you just put under that Democratic Party, 1990 to present, you know, or something. And, and, uh, and I do wonder if somewhere in the back, they did a bunch of market tests, a bunch of market tests or poll testing for the last yeah. two months. And the reason they don't have a plan is everything came up shit. They're yeah. being forced to actually make a decision because here were their options, right? You could you could pack the courts, you could propose federal legislation, yeah. you could do ticky tacky like oh we'll use federal lands and maybe repeal the Hyde Amendment, you know, which ticky tacky in the sense that they'd be important and good, but it's not doing anything to deal with the right itself. Or they could say we're going to go for the state houses, but not really say what that means, right? Or an amendment, a constitutional amendment, right? So you just run those through the poll. And my guess is what they got was sort of like 30, 40, 40 or something. <laughs> so nothing stood up because <laughs> the point is nobody else knows what to do. And why does nobody else know what to do? Because nobody's been making the democratic argument to them of what we ought to do. It's yeah. all been focused on the court. Yeah. The Democrats have never really had to make the case. And they've spent a lot of time triangulating. Hillary famously, famously said it should be legal, safe and rare and made a big point of rare to yeah. signal to the that was the last time there was a kind of pro-life part of the Democratic Party. So they never really made the argument. So ironically, the most interesting, one of the most interesting things to me is that on the one hand, the party is over the last 15 years become a completely pro-choice party. When I was a kid, there were many pro-life Democrats in Congress. There was a section of the national party that was pro-life. There is nobody. It's notable that the one person they campaign for is this one guy. Henry Cuellar. Yeah. And I can't even remember. I, th- I think he won the primary. I, d- I didn't check, forgot to check, but that's notable as an exception to the rule. So it's it's the litmus test. You cannot be a national figure in the party and not be pro-choice. On the other hand, they have no idea what to offer people. So I don't know what they are going to offer. And I that's why I wonder if they're just going to say, yeah, but they're the ones who overturned Roe and mm-hmm. not offer anybody anything. So just it's hard court- for me. Even what court packing is too much of a kind of political, um, you know, that requires too much, even that is too much political ambition for the Democrats at the moment. I mean, too much in the sense that I, it seems to me they don't think they can make the case for it. They yeah. think they're likely to lose rather than win. Yeah. And it's in part because they can't think past November. Yeah. So it, it might be losing in November. In fact, because they're going to lose so hard in November, it's probably the time to take a risk. Yeah, and indeed. build if if they were demo, you know if they were kind of able to think past if they were in any way strategic, um, but I don't think that they're going to do it, and I don't think they can be do it until they're forced to do it. I think there's another thing to say, and I don't know enough about it, but the way in which the major feminist and abortion related feminist organizations in D.C. became themselves just an extension of the party. Yeah. Now Emily's List, NARAL, all these. These, I know that doesn't mean anything to most of your listeners. These are just lot, essentially lobbying groups and fundraising groups in D.C. that lobby the um, 
Democratic Party for stuff when they pass laws and ha- try to help write legislation. And they were founded and originally kind of the residuum of these much broader based feminist groups and mobilizations in the 1960s and 70s, and then just got institutionalized. And um, they're not sure what to do, uh, yeah. as far as I can tell. And so nobody, every, it's sort of everyone looking at everyone else. Yeah. Um, but I think the stasis is really explicable by the fact that the Democrats don't know. They've relied on that NGO lobby strata as the organization basis for the party doesn't know how to make a case for a particular mm-hmm. thing and doesn't think I think it even has the internal discipline to do it. The, more, the bolder things that knows people like Manchin and Sinem and all them would never go for. Yeah. Um, and it's not enough for the left wing. So they so, don't, they don't, they, it's, it's, it's so sclerotic and static. I, I suspect um, the only progress. Uh, so, it, it, and, and this is where in a way it's an opportunity for the left. Because I do think for the reasons we were talking about before, abortion is also a chance to talk about wider institutional problems in American yeah. democracy. Like we're yeah. in this position because even if we could get a majority, we can't pass it. Yeah. And changing the constitution's nearly impossible. Yeah. So the political revolution that supposedly Sanders, you know, people like about Bernie Sanders is something that should be back on the table. Uh, is that it's an opportunity not just to think about why what the case for the right is and why it has to be one democratically, but why then, yes. because it's got to be one democratically, yes. we have to think institutionally. Yes. So I, I was wondering, um, obviously, the Democrats, we've already hinted at this, that the Democrats have always relied on, you know, for, for a good decade or more, this idea of a rising tide of reaction and, you know, the boogeyman of the right um, to right. mobilize their own forces and to raise funds and whatever. To what extent does this ruling um, strengthen mm. the right? Um, to what to what extent is it? I, I mean, I I think the answer to this yeah. personally is no. But you know, to what extent does it signal some rising tide of reaction, um, overturning of various forms of progress that have happened? You know, social liberalism since the nineteen sixties, or alternatively, you know, might this actually strengthen the right, even if it doesn't signal a, a strong right, which I don't think it is. Yeah, and let me it might play into let it. me put a let me kind of you know piggyback on that with the so I mean and I think it was what uh, Clarence Thomas is as part of Clarence Thomas's ruling that um, this also this Do, um, Dobbs ruling motivates a revisiting of um, the court's exactly. previous decisions on same sex exactly. marriage and federal access yeah. to contraception. And so the claim is that these are also imperiled. And again, this seems to me kind of very clear kind of, I mean, maybe that will, that's your answer, Alex, is maybe this is the way the Democrats will rally. We lost Roe, but we know we need to now protect gay marriage and contraception. That that seems to me, you know, admitting a defeat with no kind of way Uh to reverse it doesn't seem to me to be a very effective way to rally the troops either. But I mean, so to kind of package mine and Alex's question together, does this indicate that um, you know, kind of conservative, socially conservative Republicans are going to be on on a roll? Yeah, I mean, just say the reason I think the Democrats can't do that version of it is the Democrats know that they only win because women vote for them, and so they have to say something about abortion. <laughs> they can't just retreat to the next line of defense. I just think that's that's ruinous. On this other question, so. I, I read the majority ruling twice because I couldn't, at first, I wasn't sure I understood it. And I'm not sure I still totally understand it. But one of the puzzling things about it and what everybody's wondering is, it clearly says that the reasoning, not just behind abortion, but behind the general idea of people having all these, pri- these rights in virtue of there being a privacy right is bad legal reasoning. So it, the, it, and it says not just bad, but at some point, Alito, who writes the opinion, says it's egregiously wrong. So it opens the door and says, look, you read this and you think, time to reconsider all of these rights, then right to contraception, same sex marriage, these things all seem, many of these rights, any of them that are at least housed under this form of reasoning about there being a privacy right. 
And then they say, no, but abortion's special because it's about the state having this compelling interest in a potential life and regulating potential life. But the problem is, and, and this is why Thomas's dis- concurrence is says, yeah, it's time to go after all these things. Although it's a little complicated about what he, because he wants to then reconstitute some of them under a different, the privileges and immunities clause. But anyway, nobody else wants to do that. So, but so for all of the things that the judges, the, the majority opinion says, or it's really a plurality opinion, they, it's unclear what the logic of their ruling is, because it just seems like once you've accepted that the basic reasoning behind Roe was wrong, all the other ones have to go. And so what's holding them up? I think what happened is, I think it's not that we're going to have this huge reactionary movement taking over every branch of government. It's that this is a sort of weird counter-democratic vanguard, these judges. And their limit, they're going to look very strong, like they can, and potentially they could sweep away a number of these rights because the democratic resistance is so weak. So I think that they wrote this opinion because I think they wanted to signal heavily, we're not going after the other rights because they worried that they might be already looking illegitimate and reaching too far. But the passivity of the response might suggest, hey, no, actually, we aren't so counter, we aren't so counter majoritarian we're not so into, maybe there is actually more support for us and the resistance from the Democratic Party and the wider population isn't so great, so just, which is... I see, the and, logic and, of, I see the logic of what you're saying. So the opportunism kind of would, and I can see... No, the, it's the other way around. I think that, the, sorry, I wasn't being clear. What I was saying is they're going to look strong because yeah. democracy is so weak. So and there's the capacity to resist them is so weak. And so they just, set this ruling up, I think, expecting... Yeah, no, I understand. So creating the political space to not look like they're going to go after it. But then they might, and they might see this and say, oh, well, actually we can keep going. And then people are going to say, look, the conservatives are, it's a tyrannical power imposing itself on us. And in some sense, it's really an undemocratic one, but their power is just the negative reflection of how weak the democratic politics are. So, I mean, this is just a kind of a question of clarification. So um, I can see the, you know, the conservative hostility to same sex marriage on the grounds that it has, you know, that it's um, breaks with, you know, thousands of years of tradition or whatever. But um, given, you know, the kind of strong kind of Protestant, um, uh, you know, I don't know, kind of uh, basis of American Christianity, but also kind of, of American political culture. Why is uh, why would why would they be hostile to a federal right to contraception? Why would Protestants be hostile to a federal? Well, right I mean, in the sense, like it's, I was surprised to see it come up as part of like this conservative kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, vanguard, as you say. Um, given it's something that will be more associated with Catholicism, you know, kind of Catholic Europe, rather than conservative Protestantism? Well, um, it, it's simply because the Supreme Court case that said there's a constitutional right to access information and contraception was decided under the same ruling that there is that it's one of the freedoms you should have under this privacy right of the Constitution. So it's so purely... It's purely a question of logic in the ruling, then, rather than the fact that the con- that conservatives in the U.S. are targeting contraception. That's right. I mean, I, I I think it's an interesting kind of marker because, um, for the most part, conservatives have not sought to make contraception illegal. Their version has been to instead try to enforce abstinence education, abstinence-based sex education in schools. But I think that's because they just thought that's a lost cause. Yeah. So perhaps they'll read this and think, hey, we can ban contraception now. Uh, I, I think they'd like to. I think there are many evangelical Christians who would like to ban contra- be, be free to ban contraception, prevent it from being, maybe they'd start by saying, prevent it from being accessible on school property. Yeah. prevent it from being accessible in public toilet whatever you know say yeah. no public toilets will be allowed to, i don't know how you'd write it you can imagine these ways of writing it yeah so that it isn't initially an absolute ban but maybe they go for an absolute ban and i think it's because they 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 there is a general sense that the the, the cultural war yeah. is against 
the sexual you know, promiscuity. The con- this, yeah, the sexual mores, the permissiveness of yeah. this society and contraceptive morality. Yeah is the in the end that you know it's sex for pleasure the idea is the freedom to have sex for pleasure and experiment yeah. with with it um uh and it and it they, they see it not just as a as a sign of sexual permissiveness but also as a society without consequence of actions without consequence it undermines the idea that you ought to be responsible yeah. i mean ironically you know it is a way of being responsible <laughs> right about planning it's why it's called family you know yeah. reasonably called family planning like i don't want to have a child now i don't yeah. want this but they think that it's irresponsible yeah. um it, it creates a culture of permissiveness and therefore irresponsibility so one thing i wanted to talk about with respect to the left response is um and this has been you know so this was picked up during the covid pandemic was in the places where there was strong opposition particularly from uh, you know in red states or from libertarians or from uh, the Christian right, where there was strong opposition to vaccine mandates and masking yeah, and so on. Yeah, yeah. The case was rooted in often you saw the signs shared very widely in the media and on social media, you know, my body, my choice, um, and very kind of explicitly invoking the left's I kind know. of case for abortion, invoking it for the COVID, you know, opposition to the vax mandate. The other element of it, which is um, unavoidable, I think, is also um, the question over trans rights and squeamishness over biological definitions of womanhood that the left yeah. also are hostile mm-hmm. to. And it was very um, evident with the uh, appointment of um, uh, the, uh, the Biden's appointment to the Supreme Court when she was kind of questioned and she was unable to offer famously or notoriously unable to offer an, ans- an answer to the question of what is a woman. And I was struck. So I, you know, I mean, I'm not anyone who follows me on Twitter will know that I'm, you know, kind of uh, occasionally say controversial things. And I was very struck that the when I made, you know, when I said that it'll be more difficult to um, oppose this ruling if you don't have if you can't define a woman or words to that effect, I had much more pushback on Twitter than I've had on you know, many other things that I would assume to be equivalently controversial about Ukraine or Europe or Brexit. So there does mm. seem to me to be the kind of the unwillingness to, um, you know, the kind of the conf- the basic unwillingness to have even the debate about, um, you know, whether there is the biological category of womanhood mm-hmm. um, and the questions over COVID. I'm wondering how far this is also part of the disorganization of the left's response. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's true, I, I, uh, but I think the COVID thing is that, at least in the short term, maybe in the long term, this isn't true. But in the short term, I think the COVID thing is just far more significant because the left, in particular, not just sort of Democrats and liberals. I don't think the Democratic Party was all that excited or all that into vaccine mandates, but. The left side of it was all, and passed the Democratic Party into the left. I mean, there was, you know, I'm pretty sure Jacobin, I think Branko Marcetic wrote an article in Jacobin defending yeah, that, vaccine mandates. Yeah, that Hitler opposed vaccine mandates and therefore they must be good. It was that in the article? Hitler opposed vaccine mandates. Good Lord. That's just <laughs> ridiculous. That's that's not going to be good once he finds out Hitler was a vegetarian. You know, I mean, come on, you know, give me a break. I didn't know that that was. But the Communist Party also was against vaccine mandates. So what do you, you know? I mean, uh, give me a break. The the um, but it was so obviously an argument where they said bodily autonomy is not absolute. You know, I mean, they 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 said that to everyone. All of the friends on the left that I argued with and said vaccine mandates are unjustifiable. Uh, on, on democratic and freedom grounds, um, uh, especially given that this is nothing like any of the other vaccines we mandate, but also because it would require massively more co- coercion than any of the existing vaccine mandates um, uh, uh, and requires every, and it sort of subverts the relationship between democracy and um, and harm. I just thought, this is ruinous. So everyone knows that most, mo- let's say, a majority of the left, the, you know, the kind of the lefty left, supported vaccine mandates. And I think a- against people saying it's my body. You know, I mean, you can't do this to my body. And more to the point, children, you're making me do this to my children. I mean, I the thing that I resent the most is that I have been made to vaccinate my children. It is the, you know, one of the few times in my life when I'm like, I am absolutely done with the left. This was astonishing. Only fucking country, 
you know, really outrageous. And that this came not just through kind of uh, legal requirement, but widespread social pressure could basically couldn't socialize, you know, if you didn't vaccine chain, I'm not, I'm not going to socially isolate my children, you know? So um, really, I think that in, in any way, it really suggests then that there's something about the left that hates children, you know, now you're going to say we're pro-abortion. We're, you're, so now you really look like you're for killing kids. And then when they're alive, you're going to force parents <laughs> to stick them with these randomest technologies that do very little. Yeah. For children, children are not in danger. It doesn't prevent the spread of, you know, all this stuff. So I think that the COVID vaccine mandate thing, especially as it played out in things like schools and with kids, um, uh, and especially since it got the left into saying, no, bodily autonomy isn't absolute. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, really they, um, is, is the most crippling thing for them. They could have come out this much more consistent. And it also, I will say, is what, will make it especially hard for them to convince non-professional class people of their politics uh, because that resistance, you know. Isn't there a consistency there at least? I mean, I'm not making an argument in defense of what the left position was on COVID or vaccine mandates, but rather that it's consistent in terms of defending life, you know, bare life, perhaps, um, insisting that, you know, bodily autonomy, for perhaps that freedom you have isn't so important um, because what's important is, yeah. is is life, right? So you need to vaccinate kids at all costs. Okay, ignoring the the, the fact that it doesn't do very much for, for kids um, and that that is what matters for the left. You know, fetuses aren't, aren't, aren't human beings, you know, aren't, aren't uh, endowed with rights. And then after that, you know, we have to protect life at all costs. And I think that seems to me to be the general thrust of what the left is about today, um, obviously to its, uh, you know, to its downfall. So are you saying that these positions are consistent if you're a particular kind of leftist who doesn't actually care about freedom that much? Exactly. Who That's just what I'm wants to kind of yeah. protect life the, the, and, it's, and, it's a consist, and it's consistent with its own with the left's turn towards humanitarianism already in the you know 90s right. and onward i mean i suppose that's an argument that's sometimes made about abortion it's about women's health yeah uh and it's you know not a very good argument not because it isn't in some cases about women's health but because that's just far too diminished an argument for the right to abortion and suggests that only some people some women deserve that right only when it's their health so i just it mischaracterizes the real nature of the right there's many reasons but the point is that it's the woman who has the reasons and she gets to decide whether yeah. it's because she's going to die or because the child's going to be deformed or whether it's because it doesn't fit into their life plans yeah. that's just that you don't the point is it's a freedom where you don't inquire into the reasons so i don't um um i, I guess you're right alex that you could make the two things consistent being pro-choice and pro-vaccine mandate but that it's a pretty de- it seems to me a pretty degenerate form of leftism. Yeah, indeed. Left. <laughs> Just a, a final, a final thought, I guess, which is to kind of um, and to bring a perspective from outside the U.S. is this is something I tweeted about, but it's very striking how um, how many people seem to think that we're living in the U.S. outside of the U.S. Oh my God. And yeah. leftist uh, labor politicians, I should say, in Britain, you know, are saying, "Oh well, this is you know the Tories are going to come for abortion next." Um, I mean, it's just astonishing, kind of astonishingly um, delusional kind of totally. politics. Um, totally. And that people think somehow that there is an implication in their national jurisdiction as the result of a Supreme Court decision in the US. And I've been trying to work, you know, apart from, you know, you could talk about cultural globalization, blah, blah, blah. But I think it runs a bit deeper than, you know, just watching kind of Netflix and going to McDonald's or something. I think there is it speaks to a genuine kind of lack of connection to one's own kind of political institutions. Oh, there it is. That is the yeah, that means you live in the kind of globalist ether um, and makes you imagine that kind of cultural, you know, the kind of what you culturally consume or the country it's associated with would somehow affect you the same way, you know, that you, I don't know, follow American fashion trends or something. Well, the triumph you, of American idealism. I mean, would you call this an, an airstrip one outlook, Phil? I yeah. would call it an airstrip one outlook, George. I know you're not on Twitter, but that is actually what I say on Twitter, airstrip That's, one. I was just about so, to say that if you made an oblique reference to my article, once again, I'm going to kill you and, and, and you did it. So anyway, <laughs> now I have to kill you. So. So I got to ask you guys about this. So I have a question about this because 
So the year I spent in the UK, I was astonished at how extensive the coverage of midterm remind, elections remind in the US what was. Year. Say again. That was two thousand and one to two thousand and two. And one thing I remember watching news was just how much detail there was, how much reporting there was about stuff that happened in the US. And I came away with that thinking, well, I guess, you know, it is that's the, you know, still the peak of the unipolar moment. It's the war on terror, everybody kind of fall in line. And so, of course, you know, in the sense that the American empire kind of determines everyone's fate, everyone's got to know. And they might overestimate the degree to which that's uh, that it determines their fate. But over time and just listening to you just now, I sort of had the opposite thought, which is, well, it's exaggerated massively exaggerated and not just for the reasons you give phil but you think it's also because they just have no sense that they could resist these trends because resisting it would require to have more of a sense of their democratic authority relative to their own population why would anyone in the uk think abortion is about to be rendered illegal who's going to do it it's just ridiculous well genuinely labor politicians you know are trying to make hay with it um so it is it is genuinely Mm. ridiculous but also you know like i mean um a tour, I know it was another politician, maybe a Lib Dem, who said, like, um, you know, there is a separation between church and state in the UK, and there has been for hundreds of years, you know, like just total, I mean, right, right. complete, you know, inhabiting, inhabit, living in a different country and yeah. responding to the politics of a different country. And so, you know, it's not, I don't think it's so, I mean, I, yeah, like you say, I guess there's two ways to look at it. On the one hand, you could look at it as kind of substantively, it's living, you know, kind of everyone being a province, at least in the West of the American empire. But the flip side of that is total um, exclusion from one's own kind of national politics and, and not being and able another, to shape politics in that yeah. jurisdiction, which you actually live in. There's another element to it as well, which is the the kind of mobilization through through fear and, and blackmail is a pretty like that's a pretty widespread like playbook right i mean that's that's the the, the kind of go-to like oh what's what's going to happen the 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 bad the the bad johnson man is gonna mean no no rights or whatever i mean obviously put in slightly well slightly less eloquent terms than that in fact but i mean that's that's the idea right that it's like here is another threat yeah this is this is our way of doing things let's you know even if it's not really that plausible i saw i saw like macomb tweeting about it right um you know saying you know solidarity with us whatever i mean which in in and of itself is is fairly by the by but um i think it's obviously telling that france i mean to to macomb's credit i think he did bring uh, increase the limit from 12 to 14 weeks but that's still far too little you know abortion should be available as late as as late as necessary and so um, and I, I just had a quick look thinking, OK, because all the a lot of Europeans imagine the US to be, you know, to have banned abortion outright everywhere. And as Alex has pointed out, it's at the, you know, it still defers back to state level. I was like, well, what about Vermont? I think that's probably pretty liberal. Let's have a look there. Vermont has no limits whatsoever on on abortion. Um, and which is which is better than even the most liberal um, European states like Sweden and the Netherlands. So. Right. Yeah. No, I don't. I, I, the, the only sense I can make of it is that there's just such a limited connection between that the representative relationship is broken Yeah, between these national political officials and their own populations. And so they're, they don't understand what determines or where the final say lies in their own politics. It, it, you know, they're not colonized. I mean, it's weird. It's this weird parroting of almost being colonized, such that what the metropole decides, the U.S., then everybody <laughs> will have to fall in line. But they're just not colonized. You know, I mean, the Brexit really means you're not in any way beholden to any external. I mean, it's so weird for them to get hysterical about that, but then want to rejoin the EU or want to be in the EU. If you don't like, if you don't like other people if telling you, like you what Supreme to do, courts. Then, yeah, well, then, indeed, yeah, yeah, like, Supreme like Supreme Courts, courts. and shit, then why do you want to be in the EU? Yeah, you know, it's just ridiculous. Maybe, maybe it's a, it's more supreme than the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court isn't supreme enough, and so that's why. <laughs> you, uh, the ECJ. You, 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 I mean, it's true. The ECJ is, you know, is if you don't like the Supreme Court, then you should really, really not like the really, ECJ. I know, absolutely. Well, well, keep, keep everyone wants Brexit. everyone wants the the sort of uh, judicial daddy the ultimate liberal judicial daddy watching over us, making sure no rights get trampled and we can live comfortably in the end of history forever. Well, anyway, um, 
uh, I guess it's just to say thank you very much, Alex, for coming on and uh, helping to clear the ground for us and our listeners about the politics of Roe v. Wade. I imagine we'll be coming back to it because it seems to me like, yeah. given, like you say, the lack of um, any kind of uh, obvious or organized response, I imagine this is going to kind of fester for a while in American politics. And perhaps yeah. if there's a possibility to connect the question of liberty to political institutions and democratic representation, you know, then that's something to, um, to return to. Um, so Agreed. I'm sure we'll be talking to you about it again, but thanks anyway for joining us this time. Yeah. Cheers, thanks, Alex. Alex.